All right, we have one more speaker before morning tea and it's time to meet Peter McGee. We'll get straight into it. Peter was originally from Western New South Wales, a uh, cropping country where he worked with sheep, but he figured out it wasn't for him and he preferred to grow things. He spent some time with Yates Vegetable Seeds Research Farm, then became a motorcycle mechanic and eventually came to South Australia. Saw the light, obviously. Followed the wife. Followed the wife. Righto. As long as you got here, that doesn't matter. And fell into almond production at the end of it. Uh, talking about what we have learned so far at the Loxton Research Centre and more importantly, asking the question, what is the future? Please welcome Peter McGee. I hope you can all hear me quite well. Well, one thing I've learnt already is that I should have collaborated with the two previous speakers, so I'm not going to repeat all the stuff that they've already said. Um, really informa uh, good information there. So if we have a look at the map there, we can see that's just standard allies map. We've been looking at some sections of it that are available on the portal through the AgTech initiative to show you the images that we've got, the data we're picking up from it, how I'm utilising that on farm, all that sort of thing. So a bit of a history lesson. So back in the day, this would have been the top of the line, how to measure your soil moisture, um, tensiometers, neutron probes, G-bugs, and that would have been as, the, as granular as you could get that data to find out where your soil moisture was, uh, were at, what sort of irrigation you need to put on, where you were going to come from for your future planning for your irrigation. And it worked very well for what we had. So we weren't looking very much at sort of things like drip irrigation. Back then, it was very much large orifice knockers, sprinklers. Um, they delivered large amounts of water rather quickly. They didn't block up that easily, so that was fine. So things have changed a little. So with water requirements being what they are now, drip irrigation, we need to look at the delivery of water far more accurately. So some of the things where you've got now are dendrometer meters on trees that measure how much the trunks are swelling. So they can actually give us what they're taking up of a day, how much they're losing through a day, and we can measure the stress on the tree. That allows us to know when the tree will want to be watered again, how much water we should be putting on, and getting less and less water actually bypassing the roots before that can be utilised properly. We've got monitoring stations all over the place. Um, I have quite a lot of tech on farm. It doesn't look like much, it's an aerial, it's a probe. But for me, the data coming out of it's invaluable. So the imaging that was discussed by Andy earlier is showing me where deficiencies are that you don't pick it up easily eye to eye. Uh, Mark one eyeball is still your, ba your most basic tool. Walk around your farm, see what you're looking at. If you can't do an entire farm in a day but you've got a map of it sitting in front of your office then you can look at it for a minute and say, right, I want you to go out there and check such and such, block B, up that row, what's happened to that vine. You know, you just start utilising time much more effectively than just running blind. Okay. So people used to get this basically as what you'd receive if you had your early MEA tech stuff in the ground that was giving you soil moisture levels, a bunch of squiggly lines, could be a little bit disconcerting for some people, sometimes difficult to interpret where is it that I'm going right, where am I going wrong, and typically a little bit behind where you were in any particular day. So maybe the best of it you're seeing was yesterday or the day before was irrigation starting to show up in the sensors. Again, still once you learn to use that tool, you start looking at where's my magic number, if you take the black box one, where you can see that there's some lines really plunging through the floor and it goes up to another green line where it flattens out, that's basically me panicking and pumping water into that block like mad because I was losing my subsoil moisture. Now, I wouldn't have known to look at the block because in that block, unfortunately, the, the drip tape is buried 30 centimetres underground for an experiment. It makes it really hard to eyeball where you're looking at that block. The ones where the probes are, was above the ground, looks much better. And if I had a, a graph here, the, the image of that block that time, it's vastly different. The bottom one was irrigating nicely, the top one was irrigating horribly, and I had to change the pattern, the frequency, and the amount of water I was putting on to bring it up towards harvest. And of course, got everything nice and wet, just in time to dry it out, ready for harvest. So. 
So this is a modern graph. It's easy. Two blocks, coloured green, I must be doing things right. Now that's the thing, if I, if I log in in the morning, I do most of my looking at the farm in the first five minutes of getting to work, turn my emails on, check out my graphs, what's going on, where do I need to be tomorrow. Now of course I already know what I did yesterday, I've got historical data that I can utilise, but what if we've had a major rain event or uh, a major heat wave? So how does this change the parameter? So that's easy to interpret. You look at it, it says green, you know you're on target. Um, the left hand side is when you can start to drill down into that information. What equipment is telling me that that's fine? So is it the uh, colour of the leaves, the depth of the soil moisture profile, um, does it look like that my irrigation is going to be okay in a couple of days? And quite a lot of the maps that you're going to see on the dashboards of some of these products are a bit predictive as well. Uh, especially some of the stuff I'm using out of Israel, which is some really interesting stuff. It's the predictive power that it's going to give you now that uh, we can have a look at, right, if weather forecast in the next two days, you might not have wanted to water, but hey, we were supposed to get 15 mil last night, but it's Loxton, so we got a half. So you're never going to really rely on the predictive power of an algorithm just yet. It's getting better. I've seen stuff from Israel that's coming out that's nearly accurate out to a month. It's scary how good they are getting it. Unfortunately, last Thursday they told me I was going to get 17 mil, and we got it. 34, nice storm, and everyone else is pretty familiar how that went. So these are, again, a bunch of stuff coming together in one platform. So this is the collaborative idea. So not only are we using one company's products, we're getting a lot of companies that are joining together so that they can come into a dashboard like the SWAN system. Again, it's all about drilling down into the information in there to find your specific need, what you want to get out of the programs, how it's going to work for you. It's worth chasing them around, having a look and seeing what the comparisons are. Now, for my citrus lines, they might look different from what you guys might need for the, the, the viticulture and vice versa. So um, it's still, like the guys are saying, a really rapidly growing process, program and procedure that just, it can be a little bit daunting just following it. And I've got so many of these platforms already set up for the portal, I'm sort of chasing through and watching them change nearly every second day to an update here or this has been added there. And it's really, really good to see that the progression's happening and it's actually going to, uh, well, it's evolved would probably be the best word to use. So we're getting better at understanding what do we want to find out, the problems that the guys are pointing to, what's difficult for us, where do we need that information, what's going to work. It's a thing in progress, yep, we are still making mistakes, I'm still learning how to drive some of this stuff. Um, I'm irrigating by phone, who isn't these days, but I'm also learning that if I haven't got an accurate flow rate recorded for the program, the program can't give me an accurate measurement of what I've got to do for water. So it's a two-way street. So some of it we're walking up the hill, some of it we're going back down, picking up where we left off and keep on going. Um, but it's the beauty of actually having an alert system that says, oh, my watering system's starting to clog up. Better go and check a filter. If you've got flow meters in, it'll tell you exactly where to go. You're saving time. If you go the other way, oh, too much water. I must have a blowout. If you've got, uh, or a leak, so if you've got an overhead image that says, right, that patch is a lot more wetter than it should be, you don't have to go hunt for it, you know exactly where it is, you're saving time. All the tech that we get, and it's one of the things that Andy said last, was we need the time to be able to get the job done. We're trying to do more with less of everything because of tighter margins, too much to do not being able to actually um, get out and do it yourself stresses you out. You know you want to be on your block. You know you want to be able to tell, right, my vines are in as good as Nick as I can make them. And if you haven't got that time to get around and do it or you're chasing your tail, fixing plumbing problems or another blowout or not knowing how well your emitters are going in, in your drip lines, that's where this stuff is invaluable. This is where like uh, the gentleman who from the Barossa, I saw, I think McLaren Vale, he's got an issue where his irrigation wasn't adequate. And 
I'm doing exactly the same thing. So the research farm has had uh, 50 odd years of experience here. A lot of the equipment hasn't caught up from about the last 30 years, mainly because programs have changed, stuff like that. I've walked into it with a set of open eyes. Um, I've literally haven't been here 12 months. So I can walk around the block and see differences already in where I've changed historical patterns, um, where the information that I'm getting is telling me, right, do this now. And if I don't have the historical knowledge of the block that but the guys that I work with do, this is the tool I need so that I don't have to go back through books and look at, oh, where did we water this last year? How much nitrogen did we put on? It's there. It's waiting. So again, this is a, a, another collaborative map. It gives you uh, some ideas of where you need to be predictives. Uh, you've got a whole lot of equipment on the side that we can actually drill down into to, to find out exactly where in that patch of navels I've got adequate water, inadequate water, nutrition, etc. All it does is save me time. I don't have to drive around that block, look at individual leaves and examine the trees. And in that block, you would be a bit stuffed if you didn't know what was going on in there because there's a whole heap of different scions on a whole heap of different root uh, rootstocks. So nothing's um, a blanket, it's a patchwork quilt. And it can really confuse people. You go past a, a tree that looks really yellow, think, oh, I've got to get the nitrogen on. And the one right next to it's bright green. So yeah, a bit of fun working on a research farm. It's definitely not your normal. Okay, so this is uh, basically irrigating in the desert. And this is what we do in the Riverland anyway. Without the river, we wouldn't be here. This is uh, just how precise we need to be these days. Exactly where the water's got to go, how much of it, what sort of fertilizers is in it. And things like if you're going to be using a really good drip tape, where's your filtration system? How good's that? Is it back flushing on time? If you don't know that, then you really are chasing your tail a little bit. So one of the things that um, I'm pushing for at the moment is to bring the farm into the 21st century and I'm starting right at the beginning. Right at my CIT valve, I'm gonna put in the best filter I can get. The cleaner the water, the cleaner the emitters. The cleaner the emitters, the uh, smaller orifices I can use in sprinkler jets and not have to worry about going and fixing blocking things. Saving time, using less water, better application. Everything that we've got to try and do as an industry, doesn't matter if it's viticulture, horticulture, even broad scale farming as, as it stands today, the efficiencies that we need to have, they're coming. The tools that we can use are developing. It's an exciting time to be alive. I've got a program running over there at the moment that the Israelis have set up and it's basically measuring two trees either side of a block and it'll tell the irrigation system, it's time to water. I'm a hands off. Now, right now, it's still in experimental stages. So it could go very well, it could go not so great. And so one of the things I got yesterday was my next set of uh, images from Ceres. And I can look identical, uh, uh, straight at what that section of the block that's the experiment is. And I can look at above it and say, that's my section I'm watering. And that looks a bit wet and that's their section they're watering and it looks a bit stressed. Now normally I'd panic and throw the water on but I've got to let the computer do that so we'll be watching how that goes. But it's the design of it is so that it might look like for a historical perspective that the trees are stressed but they're actually measuring just how stressed those trees need to be before they can take up the most amount of water with the least amount of irrigation. And it'll be revolutionary if this kicks off. It'll be uh, just a, ch a game changer and it'll make you change the way you think of how your plants work. So robotics is something I'm looking at later. So this is the future of where we can be in a little while. So robotics is, is a really young industry so far in Australia for picking fruit. Uh, there's a young fellow in Victoria who's had a real go at it for oranges as well. We've got problems that the human hand is a wondrous thing and it can do things that robots right now cannot do. Um, so these are things that hopefully trials on farm may happen at some stage, I don't know. 
if I can get a robot on the place to show you how it works, I'd love it. It'll just be fun. The guys that are actually starting to do this though, it's more about the imaging, how to teach a robot to pick a tree is about machine learning. And what we're doing with a lot of the programs and the university here is machine learning. So we're teaching the computers how to recognise the problems or find the, the product that they need. And it's a lot of complicated work at the moment and very experimental. But we are getting to the stage of where we will be able to let the computer do a lot of the work for you. There's another really nice robot that they've got running around in, in Tasmania that's basically just a walking platform with a bin in it. You wear a beeper on your belt and a conveyor belt follows you past the tree. So you don't have to fill up a bag, take it back, empty your bin. You just pick apples all day and you put them straight down the elevator that don't, never leaves your side. It saves time. It saved bags. You know, I'd really love to give away my picking bag, but I've got Valencia's to get off those bloody trees. So automation in spraying as well. So this was mentioned as well by Andy. This is where optics target exactly what you want. So whether it's a fertiliser foliar application or a uh, weed aside application, uh, fungicide in canopies, any gaps, you simply stop the sprayer, you keep going past. It's not particularly new, it's getting better. The expense, the systems are expensive, but you can look at saving up to 50% of chemical on any application. It adds up over time, it will pay for itself. America's got a few bits and pieces going at the moment. It's not really picked up in Australia yet, mainly probably because of the overhead costs and the support isn't quite there yet. It is going to be coming. Broadacre's using it in spot in their, their Broadacre spraying all the time now. It'll hit horticulture like a bomb when it all kicks off because we all know the costs of our inputs are going up, especially with the supply problems we have at the moment. Anytime we can save a dollar there and save time doing the job out there, we're going to win. Next generation robots, they can drive the tractors, they can do it all night. Um, you'll actually get some sleep at harvest if this thing takes off. This is, uh, it's very futuristic at the moment, but we see the technology becoming alive everywhere around the place. Everyone knows how accurate now your GPS is. You can use radio locator beacons to be even more accurate directly in your paddocks. You can set networks of these up over as big an area as you like. Once you've programmed the computer in once to go around and do it, you won't have to worry about missed rows of anything. You start to incorporate all this together and the future's looking a bit like, uh, well, not Terminator, that's a little bit nasty, but uh, we're looking forward to where some of the things that we can do, that we have to do, we'll be able to have the time to do it easily because one of these things is running around doing the spraying or something like that. We're getting to the stage where that's a bit futuristic, it's my crystal ball. Again, if I ever get one on site, I'd love to show you. It'll be fantastic. So these are our collaborators so far that are on farm, and they're growing all the time. They're changing. We're evolving. So it's a little bit hard to keep track of who's who and who's doing what and uh, who's due on Tuesday at 5 o'clock to do whatever, but it's never boring. We're all enjoying it, and it, it's a great collaborative team. It's working. We hope we can help you with anything else that you need to know about it. And in which case, this is how you get hold of us. You can come through the portal, you can come through the website, you can ring us and poor old Mark Skews, he's going to be your guide. He's doing the lead research for most of this and putting it all together on farm. I'm just the poor old farm manager, I've got to go out and pick some oranges. So I hope that's not as uh, boring as it sounded, but anyway, if you can, I'd just like to, to um, encourage everybody, talk to these guys, say what you think you need to find out, what they can help you with, and the future's rosy. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Peter before he runs away? Yes, another one down the back there. We'll get the microphone down to you again. Thanks, Peter. Um, with all this data we're collecting, uh, obviously we're collecting heaps. If we project ourselves forward for 10 years, are we moving our focus of our management from per patch or per vine per tree? 
Exactly is that, the latter. Is that where we're hitting? Yep. Um, the accuracy or the granular data we can collect is actually going to be pointing directly to that sort of thing. With the optics we've got, we're also looking at uh, the, the bits that are picking up obvious disease um, or nutritional deficiencies. We are literally going to get down to individual vine, individual tree. Um, we should be able to, at, by that stage, have mapped out what's exactly happening on our properties as accurately as possible. So it's like addressing things like micronutrient problems in soil structures after that or adapting foliar sprays to take care of that sort of thing. The robotic stuff that I said before, look, you can, it'll be quite simply the case of you'll target that particular disease on these particular trees, send it out, it goes, does the job, comes back, goes beep and parks itself at the recharge board. But that is exactly where we're going. I can already point to on most of the maps that I've got where I've got stumps or I've had a blowout. So even at this early stage, we, we've already got the granular data that we can go to row to row, to vine to vine, not a problem. But soon it'll be more of a case of individually managing every vine, every tree, each as a, a complete unit. Tony Randall from the SA Drought Resilience Hub. Just following on from that question, do you think that could apply to broad, broad acre farming as well, individual plant management? In the broad acre, it'll be a little bit less scaled in, um, but the, it's, it's simply because of the amount of work that you'd have to do. So again, if you're taking the overhead imagery, that'd be some of the, the best ways to start. You would be targeting within, say, metre by metre square. So, say you missed, you know, I had a blockage on the uh, fertiliser feeder on the, on the air seeder or something similar to that, you'll be able to go and rectify that post application, take an image, see if you've got a nitrogen deficiency, see if you've got a disease patch. Um, you know, it's, when you start seeing rain like this, you might be worried about the take all or something else like that. It might not be as tree to tree and vine to vine as I expect horticulture to turn into, but certainly you're going to be looking at really micro level in hectares. So yeah, I do believe so. Thanks. Hey Peter, just a quick question. Do you think, would you guys be open, um, you know you were showing some of those amazing kind of autonomous, um, like Gus, the one in yep. almonds and stuff. Do you think, would you be open here, it's probably the same as well for that, for the MP, like to kind of be a twin city with like maybe one of the towns that's similar to Loxton, maybe in the Central Valley? Because again, like just stuff that's going on in the world, a lot of those things seem to be in California. Mm. And um, I don't know if it's been under consideration, but, but they've been starting to twin up with like, oh, there's definitely a twin happened for like the Apple industry between the US and 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 Great Britain and stuff's just moving between the two parts of the world and I don't know if that's something you'd be open to but um, I think they'd be open to it. I wouldn't be the ultimate arbitrator of where the what we do uh, but I can certainly say on a, as a personal thing I'd love it you know and it's the sort of thing where Farming really is a community thing. We, we don't just all do it for ourselves, we, and we tend to look out for each other, and I think we do that internationally as well. So, yeah, like any sort of collaborative affair that we can come up with that's going to help the, uh, the, the Riverland in general or across Australia, we have to look at it in a positive note. We can't really sort of just screw up our nose or, or particular nationalities or anything else like that because when it comes down to farming, we all are still Mother Nature's slaves. We do our best, but uh, we've got to help each other where we can. So yeah, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, just on the back of what Ollie's just uh, the question he's asked, uh, the collaboration, and we look at Central uh, Central Valley in California for what they're doing. Um, picking up on the previous speakers, we've sort of put a fair bit of emphasis on vineyards. Mm. Um, if we look at what the, the amount of budget that the, either the state government or the federal government put into agriculture and just as importantly ag tech, we look at a, a, a one-off business in California, let's say Gallo, uh, they put in over $100 million a year in um, research and development but also now a big emphasis on ag tech. They have fully autonomous vineyards over there. Yeah. 
um, and they also have a, a budget that you just you just can't jump over. So are we looking at collaboration with uh, you know other other countries or other businesses? Um, you know, I know that Nick, in their the head of their R and D at Gallows, is very happy to share knowledge. But are we? Do we have an ability to go over there? Do we have an ability to, to share our knowledge with their knowledge and, and vice versa? At the moment, on um, this would be much more towards Ben's uh, side of things. So there is, um, I, I know at the moment for what we're doing, we're trying to introduce as much as possible from all over the place. Whether or not we actually have an international collaborative going as a direct thing, I think that's more to Ben's prerogative. Ollie, you might have more more knowledge in that space. Is, is there any comment that you'd like to make? Um, I don't know. Well, actually, it's interesting. Gallo, just, you know, with the vineyard mapping stuff we've done, like Gallo are trying to, yeah, we've shared what we're doing with them because they were looking at doing exactly the same stuff. So, yeah, I, it feels like there's, uh, again, the scale that they have is amazing. And, um, like, I, I was fortunate enough to, you know, like we have a, just in the wine industry, we have that great wine capitals twin between sort of Adelaide and South Australia and, and Sonoma and Napa. And, and we got to go out there under that program. They do like a bursary that paid for some flights for us to go out to California. We did a meet up in California with the, with the ag tech community in California, shared what was going on. Um, it was only small stuff, but ground up, but shared what, this was four years ago, what was going on here at the time. And then they shared what was going on there and some of the things that now are here with Arable and, and D3Ag, that was when we first saw that out in America and it was like what growers were actually really using. So, yeah, I, I think that I totally agree the appetite's there and like this is the wealth of knowledge and, um, and, and all of that automation's there if, if we can. And, and I don't think they realise in America quite the scale of things that are here and we're under the same challenges and, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we're just going to go with one more question and then we can, yeah, we'll go to you, uh, Ben. Thanks for your presentation. Ben Hazlitt here. Um, just wondering, we talk about tree to tree or vine to vine type uh, management. Um, you can certainly see that on uh, a foliar application scale, put a data file into a tractor and away you go. Yep. What do you think the future is going to look like on that basis with regard to irrigation, fertigation? Because um, largely they're the major inputs that we've got. Uh, they're the things that we can have major effect on our vineyards or orchards with. Yep. How do you imagine that we're going to be watering each plant individually? Watering each plant individually, that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of what I was thinking. Um, I could actually see that being something that may take a form in the future, but it'd still be looking section to section, at least for your major fertigations and that sort of thing. Right now with uh, some of the Goltec uh, irrigation planning systems, you can set everything up to, to be scalar to each valve so you, you know exactly what's going into your crop for that area. Whether or not you could actually do it as a macro level any finer than that, possibly. I'd like to see it in the, uh, in the practice in the field at least as a startup or an experiment. I think one of the problems you'll find there is once we start getting into the complexity of having a single, single irrigation point to a single tree, is that the more plumbing you have, the easier it is to clog it up. So there's a level of where the simplicity of the system has to be able to work with you, the complexity of the system. So yeah, I think where we're looking at at the moment is still for major fertigation irrigation needs, we'd only be looking at a single valve by valve application. But still, it's that if that's as granular as we needs be, and then still be able to identify other problems, it's still a tool we can use. Thanks very much. Better give me a round of applause.